a while back I was reading a, a piece, someone complaining about the idea of translating the word kusala as skillful. And he was saying that in Western ethical thought, the idea of skillfulness plays no role, so why should we introduce it? It's a very narrow attitude. As if whatever Buddhism has to offer has to go through our filter first before we'll accept it. And we're unwilling to have our horizons expanded. Actually introducing the idea of skillfulness to ethics would be a very useful thing. Because it makes the point that, on the one hand, just good intentions are not enough. They have to be skillful. And you can learn from your actions and apply what you've learned to future actions. This is just one of the many ways in which Buddhism introduces a lot of concepts that may seem foreign to us at first. And they are foreign. But the more you get to live for the concepts, the more you realize that they, they're very useful, especially for the purposes that the Buddha assigns to all of his teachings, which are to understand suffering and stress and to use that understanding to put an end to them. One set of concepts that's very often underestimated is the concept of property, dhatu in Pali. Sometimes here it translated as element, and people tend to think of the medieval elements when they hear that something we've outgrown in the West. But it's very useful when you're meditating to think in terms of these properties. In English we have the word proprioception, which means your sense of the body as felt from within. And this is where the properties are really useful, because they start dividing that sense of the body from within into categories that are really useful. This breath or wind, which is a sense of energy, fire, which is a sense of warmth, liquid, which is a sense of coolness, and then earth, which is a sense of solidity. And as you sit here inhabiting your body, it's useful to have a sense of these different aspects of what you're feeling as you're inhabiting your body. It's good for concentration, good for discernment. In terms of concentration, there's that nice passage where the Buddha gives instruction to Rahula even before Rahula starts doing breath meditation, saying, make your mind like earth. Earth doesn't get disturbed by nice things or unpleasant things. You can throw garbage on earth and earth doesn't react. This is a good image to hold in mind. When you're going through a difficult situation, people are saying things you don't want to hear or doing things you don't want to see done. And your mind is reacting. Ask yourself, well, is the earth part of your body reacting? Are the bones reacting? The bones are not. Try to get a sense of your bones and then make your awareness like the bones, like that sense of solidity. And you find that you can endure things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to endure. Learn a lesson from Earth. These properties are also useful as you're trying to settle down and gain a sense of well-being in the body, especially with the breath. And you can think of the breath as a whole body process that makes the breath a much better object for meditation than just having it in one spot, say, at the nose, or just the air coming in and out that can be felt at the nose or the lips. Because after all, we're trying to develop a state of full-body awareness in our concentration. And it's good to have something that does extend throughout the body as our object, so that when they talk about singleness or preoccupation, it's single in both senses. Single in the sense that it's the one thing that you're focusing on, and it's the one, <clears throat> the one sensation that's filling the body. And of the various elements, the breath is the 
easiest to manipulate, the easiest to push into the different directions to adjust, to get it so it's just right. Feels good coming in, feels good going out. The breath is your first experience of the body. We have a tendency to think that it's the solidity of the body that's there first and then the breath comes in afterwards, but no, it's the breath is what enables you to sense the body. If it weren't that energy going through the nerves, going through the blood vessels, you wouldn't be sensing the body at all. So breath comes first and the other properties come later. And as you get a sense of the breath, you can focus on those properties. You can get them into balance, too. John Fuhring would often have his students, as soon as the breath calmed down and was very still in the body, focus first on fire, the warmth in the body. Where in the body is the warmest spot right now? Focus on that and see if you can magnify it, both in the sense of making it stronger and then letting it spread throughout the body the same way that you've let the breath spread. If things get too warm, then you can think of water. Water is cooling. Again, where's the coolest spot in the body? Focus on that. And then let that sense of coolness spread. Then try to balance out the two so it feels just right, not too hot, not too cold, just like Goldilocks. Then you can focus on earth, the sense of solidity in the body. Some people really enjoy this because it gives a sense of being grounded in the meditation. Other people find it oppressive. When things get very solid, you feel like you can't breathe. So if it feels too solid, think of mixing the breath and the, and the earth. Those are the two pairs. There's water and fire make one pair, and then breath and earth make the other pair. Try to get things into balance. And this is where you make the body a much more comfortable place to settle down. And it's good for your health when you get a sense of these properties from inside. And the body begins to feel out of balance. You can question yourself, okay, which of the properties is excessive and which one is weak? The Buddha's theory of properties, the way they talk about it, is that Certain properties get provoked. When the wind property is provoked, outside, of course, there's a windstorm. So when the water property is provoked, there's floods. The fire property is provoked, fires start and then spread. And you find that you can provoke the same things in the body. And often a lot of illnesses, the sense of the body is just not right. Even though the Doctors might say that it's due to a, this or that chemical imbalance. You feel, it, you feel it directly. You don't feel chemicals. You don't feel oxygen, but you do feel these properties. And if you're sensitive to them and learn how to strengthen ones that are weak, you can bring things back into balance. When you're feeling lightheaded, think of Earth. Think of something that grounds you, that keeps you next to the Earth. When the body's feeling sluggish, when you're feeling depressed, try to think more of breath to leaven the sense of the body. And of course, when you're feeling too cold or too hot, you can think of the opposite, the opposite property to bring things back into balance. Now you find that there are limitations on this one, simply based on the condition of the body and two based on the power of your concentration. But as you get a sense of the body as it's felt from the inside, you find that you have a handle on some of these things. You have some control over how your your body's going to feel. This is where the analysis into properties is helpful for insight. You see the power of perception. Just hold in mind the perception of warmth, and things will warm up. And the more confidence, or what they call assurance, that you give to that perception of warmth, 
the stronger the effect is going to be. So there are potentials. that you can see the extent to which your directed thought, your evaluation, your perceptions really do have an impact on your feelings. How are your experience in the body right now? And of course it helps to depersonalize things. This body is just a lump of elements, it's just a lump of properties. Same properties as everybody else's bodies. The image the Buddha gives is of a butcher sitting at a crossroads cutting up a cow. Of course, as you cut up the cow, the perception of cow goes away, and it's replaced by the perception of meat or bones or the other organs. In the same way as you get a sense of the body in terms of its properties, the sense of its being my body. gets replaced simply by, oh, there's earth, there's water, there's wind, there's fire. Around it is space. And then there's consciousness that knows these things. All of these things can be seen as impersonal properties. Space and consciousness are useful for getting beyond the form jhanas into the formless states. In other words, once you've got the breath still and you've got the other elements in balance. Just trying to maintain that sense of being balanced right here. Then you notice that because the breath energy isn't flowing in and out, there's not that much sense of the, the boundaries of the body. Then you see what, what's holding everything together, what's holding your sense that there is a body here. Simply your, the metal label of form. If you drop that metal label, you have a sense that the body is just a mist, like the little dots in a cloud, dots of water in a cloud. The sense of boundary gets very fuzzy. That's when you focus in on the space between the dots, and that takes you into the formless states. This helps both with your concentration. And again, with your insight, the realization that an awful lot of your perception of reality is based on the mental labels you're carrying around, and you have the option of dropping them, replacing them with other labels, in this case the sense of infinite space. Space is good for when things in the body just cannot be brought into balance. Things feel out of whack, and nothing you can do seems to get them back into whack. So if you can go to space, just hang out there for a while. I think I've told you the story of a John Fuang student who had a voice in her meditation one night saying she was going to die. And sure enough, her body started feeling like it was going to, all going to fall apart. She said it was like a house on fire, no place in the body she went to offered her any comfort at all. And then she thought of space, and so she went to space, hung out there for a while. And then things in the body returned to normal. So of course she didn't die, and that's how she lived to tell about it. So it's a good option to keep in mind when things in the body are not going well. And even before you get to the point where you can hold on to these perceptions to the point of really being thoroughly in, say, the, the formless attainment of space, infinite space, just having that perception in mind and realizing that there is a part of your awareness here that does correspond to space. It's the same as with the bones, with the earth, that when you want to make the mind be like earth, you just get in touch with whatever earthiness you can feel inside the body and helps give you a sense of gives a sense of solidity to your awareness well in the same way space is very useful you think of things just going through space and nothing affects the space 
Space permeates everything, it goes through atoms, out in all directions. As it passes where Mogollon is approached by some, some women who won't attempt him. And he says it's like trying to paint pictures on space. There's no, there's no surface. You can think of the same way when difficult things are happening, difficult things are being said, being done. They can just go right through you without leaving any trace. It's a good perception to have in mind, to replace your ordinary perceptions of being offended by the words and having to react to the words. Space doesn't react. So these perceptions are useful in lots of ways. So it's good to familiarize yourself with them. And realize that holding on to some of these new concepts opens up entire new dimensions in your experience and in your ability to deal skillfully with all kinds of issues. This is one of the reasons why it's good to be open to new concepts, new ways of looking at things, and not be narrowly focused on just, just what comes from our original culture. If that were attitude, we'd, we wouldn't have many opportunities at all to really get to know what the potentials are within the body and within the mind. And we'd be depriving ourselves of a lot of the tools that are really, really useful in learning how to understand how we create suffering and learning how to understand how to put an end to that.